Are measurements really important? You don't need to measure. Just wing it. Throw stuff in a bucket, put an airlock on, it'll work, right? Okay, this is a brew talk, and usually this is where we would have comments from all of our viewers. And there's two reasons why we're not going to be doing comments today. The first is because my computer crashed right after I finished getting them all typed up. Not really the reason, but it's something, and it made me think about it too. As I was pulling up these comments, we were having many of the same thing over and over. So pulling out just one is kind of unfair. And second, if we were to read some of these comments, it might be taken in the wrong light. We're not making fun of people for asking these questions. More, they're an example of something that we felt if enough people are asking, we need to address it, we need to answer it and take care of it. So that's why there's gonna be no comments today, but um, I'm still gonna throw a paper because I have notes. Okay. Ironically, Brian is wearing his brew like a Viking, not like a chemist shirt. Which, why is that irony? Because you would think Vikings probably didn't measure where chemists do. I'm going to disagree. They measured. People have been measuring for years and years and years. Even like the imperial measurement system with cups and teaspoons, that's measurement. They used to use their hands for bowls and things like that. Each yeah. measurement was unique to you, not standardized. So when you wrote a recipe, it might be three handfuls of this. Well, my hand is a lot bigger than, say, Derica's hand, so it would be very different if she did that. And that's why we have standardized measurements today. But even using those human relation measurements, it still has the same ratio mm -hmm. of the different ingredients for that particular relative batch. Relative to them and relative to their so recipe. So it yeah. would still be an effective means of measurement. Mm -hmm. And that's where we get like a foot, <laughs> things like that. They're all from actual measurements. But anyway, when you talk about measurement, what measurements are we talking about at all? For one, spagur, okay, specific gravity. <laughs> Just say spagar because it's funny and it's easier. Specific gravity is literally the density of a liquid relative to water. Okay, so like if it's a 1.100, and notice I'm not saying 1100, I'm saying 1.100 because people have been all over me about that. But I'm saying four digits, and you should too, because 1.100 is not the same as 1.01 .01 or 1.001. It's not the same at all. <sighs> Those of you that do that know who I'm talking about. <laughs> All right, anyway, so spigur is one of them and volume and weight is another because, okay, just knowing your specific gravity is one thing, but you wanna know how much you put into that to get to that number and things like that. There's so much to it. Um, something that's come up a lot and it happens on both of our channels the opposite way. On the Bruce channel, I use mostly imperial measurements because, well, we're using a US gallon, we're using pounds, because that's how honey is measured here. So when I measure out honey in pounds and I use a US gallon, our metric friends get mad at me and say, why can't you use metric measurements? Well, okay, a, a gallon is 3.785 liters. A pound is 454 grams. It's just a conversion, it's the same thing. But one thing that does make this a little bit easier, we use the 46 points system for sugar, right? Which means 0 0.046 gravity, or 0 0.046 gravity for being specific, of, <laughs> so 0 0.046 gravity per pound of white sugar in a gallon of must. Now that's not plus a gallon of must, that's mixed into a full gallon. In other words, one pound of sugar in a gallon is 1.046 gravity, roughly. If you wanted to do that in liters and use the metric system, 120 grams of white sugar is 46 points in a liter of must. Whew. I figured all that out a little while ago, wrote it down, and I remembered it, so we're good. <laughs> if you want to go with honey, and I'm still I'm trying to do it in a way that keeps the 46 and the 35, okay? It's 120 grams per liter. That's the simplest way. So 120 grams of honey in a liter of must is 35 points or 1.035. When I say points, I actually mean does 0, 0.0 something. So like 100 points is 1.100, that kind of thing. Makes it a little bit confusing. I understand. I'm going to try to use the Spagur readings instead of saying points. So that point, that 46 points is not 46 points. It's 0 0.046 gravity. Because I'm going to be honest with you, math is not my friend. Oh, so when no. Brian starts babbling these numbers, it's like she hears in peanuts, cloud, the, the uh, 
the um, teacher went, Unicorn. <laughs> she has no idea what I'm talking about. I, my, I'm sure my eyes just kind of roll in the back of my head. So jumping back and forth that way makes it even more confusing to me. And when I try to answer your questions, it's kind of like busy, three different systems because like, saying like 1100 versus 1.100 or 100 points. So I'm going to try to be more consistent. It's just this is the way I learned it. And I just jump back and forth. Some numbers sound better as 1100 versus 1.100. It, <laughs> His brain works that way. Mine does not. Yeah, what'll really fry your noodle is when I start telling you that I see volumes and colors and shapes. <laughs> but that's another show. All right. Um, volume and weight is really important because that way you know what you're putting in. You know how much you have to purchase to be able to make that recipe. Because if you tell us, oh, I used two pounds of honey. Well, did you do use two pounds of honey in a one-gallon batch? Did you use two pounds of honey in a five-gallon batch? That is a huge difference in the ratios between your sugars and your liquids. One thing that you may have noticed, in the very beginning of the show, we used to use uh, a lot of volume measurements, like I used cups of sugar. I find that to be vastly inaccurate, so that's why we've actually switched to pounds, because that way the grain of your sugar doesn't change it. And I learned this from flour on the cooking channel. Yeah. Oh my God, I've switched over to doing weights. And you know, in the very beginning, I actually would um, like measure the honey into a container and then pour that container into the fermenter. And somebody said, why don't you just put the fermenter on there and pour it right in. Ding, 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 ding. Yeah, so see, <laughs> we learned too. And there's been so many things that we've changed along the way. We're getting to where we use weight, whether it's the imperial system or the metric system, you know, it depends on what we're doing. If, if you're using a standardized system because that's what your country uses like I can't I can buy liter fermenters but a one liter fermenter doesn't make any sense to me I already own all these gallon fermenters and almost gallon fermenters we're not really sure what the wide mouth ones are but you get used to that's what you have and that's what we do plus I'd like to point out that 87 percent of our audience is in America so 80 87 out of 100 people watching our videos are using the system that I'm talking about I will do my best to try to use more metric things when we're doing the conversions, but honestly, the conversions aren't that different because we're all still using weight. If you were using volume and I'm using weight, now the conversion becomes much more complicated. Yeah. So yeah. I urge you to use weight for everything, just all the time. And this is another point that I would like to interject in this moment that's kind of a segue, but it's very important to the reason and the impetus of why we're doing this particular brew talk today. And that's because our main purpose for this channel, for all of our channels actually, is for education and as educators we are trying to talk to a broad level of degree of excellence in our audience so you may be brand new you may have been doing this for years but then haven't touched it for years and got back into it because you saw one of our videos or you may do this every day those of you who do this every day probably can use your five senses to estimate if what you're doing is right. Those of you, you of you who are brand new or those of you who are getting back into it who might be a little rusty need these measurements. And not only do you need these measurements to make something that works, you need these measurements so that when you make something that works, you can do it again. We had very few notes when we started this, but I would like to point out something major in what she just said. I'm teaching you things. Think about that for a minute. Scary thought, right? <laughs> anyway, um, but yeah, what she said is absolutely true. It's kind of like, um, and I'm going to bring this over to baking for a minute too and cooking. When I make pasta, I don't necessarily have to measure things anymore. I can pretty much put out the right amount of flour, the right amount of egg, the right amount of water and work it because I know what yeah. it feels like. Once we get our hands in there, we're like, oh, this is too dry or oh, this is too wet but we can't convey that information to you through the medium of video. She stole my line. I was gonna say that. <laughs> but that's the truth. How do I tell you it's this sticky, or it's this wet, or it's this pliable? There's no way to know. It's just like when we're giving you tasting notes. My idea of sweetness and your idea of sweetness are different things. Yeah. So I can only give you a relative idea. That's why we like to say, well, this tastes like a 1020 to me. And if it's a 1020, then that, and you get something that comes out. See, I did it again. 1020. 1.020. <laughs> if I say this tastes like a 1.020 gravity, that's an amount of sugar left in that brew. So if I tell you that tastes sweet to me and you make the same thing and it comes out at 1.020, you now know how sweet that is to you relative to how I said it. 
So over time, if you watch enough of our videos, you'll actually get a really good idea yeah. of what's what. And that's our goal, is we want you to understand. We're learning right along with you guys. We have learned so much in the two and a half years of doing this show. And that's another part of being an educator that I've found... You I've, teach us as much as we teach you. I've been an educator far longer than I care to admit. But four every years. time... Four. <laughs> He's so cute. But every time I teach a different topic, I learn more about that topic than yeah. I knew before teaching it. Yeah, we actually go on the internet and do a lot of research and we've read books and all kinds of stuff to have the, the knowledge that we have. And we alter that knowledge because no matter what source you get it from, you have to understand with brewing especially, there's a lot of myth and conjecture, yeah. okay? And we try to dispel some of those myths and some of the untruths and you know what you need, what you don't need, the basics of it. We are obviously aiming towards more of a beginner crowd and more of a crowd that wants to keep things simple whether they're beginner or advanced I mean we have people I, I had a guy that told me he's been brewing wine for 60 years watches our videos and still learns something I was shocked I'm like dude can I get you on the show because I'm pretty sure you could teach us a few <laughs> things you know and it's stuff like that that we cover a wide range but at the same time it boils down to beginners uh, people who want to keep it simple, people who just simply don't have time for all the stuff, and people who don't want to spend so much. Um, we did get a comment. Somebody said that our methods are too complex, they don't understand all the math, and not everybody has all of the contraptions that we have. I want to point something out. Other than a fermenter and an auto siphon, this is pretty much the contraptions we have. Everything here, plus an auto siphon and a fermenter, can be purchased for less than $100 US. Take the scale out and it's under 50 bucks. You want a scale, but it doesn't have to be a fancy scale. This is actually a pretty nice one. You can buy them for like 20 bucks at the grocery store. So this is not an expensive hobby to get into unless you make it that way. And a lot of people question, oh, you have the good stuff in another room. No, we really don't. And you know why? There's a couple of reasons. First, we work in a very small space. Um, our VIP members have seen how small. Yeah. <laughs> um, literally, this is... It's like the wall here and our camera is five feet away and right behind that is the refrigerator. Yeah, it's, it's, but it right it's up that tight. It. <laughs> and, you know, it's because we live more simply than some people do. We have a relatively small house. St. Petersburg, Florida is not known for huge houses, okay? A lot of them are pretty small. So we have a small space, which means I don't have room to keep, you know, 55-gallon conical fermenters in my next room. I don't have that kind of space. And I don't want to. That's just insane. So what you see here is how we brew. Anytime we brew, we don't have the fancy stuff off on the side that you can't see. We don't do that. And everything that you see us do is all really done on camera. We don't do, we don't open lids and things like that off camera on purpose because we want to be honest. We want you guys to see what we're really doing. But that comes down to consistency and being able to reproduce that. So if we didn't give you an, a proper measurement or an accurate measurement, you couldn't reproduce it. And I will say this, I go through the comments all the time and 99 times out of 100, the comments back on a video are about making that, like if someone made that brew, the comment is, I did what you said, as long as they actually did what we said, and it came out great, rather than, I did what you said, it was crap. Usually when they say that, I say, okay, let's talk about that and figure it out. And it turns into, I did it exactly the way you did. Except, except that I did I, this, 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 Yeah, this, I made this, two this. gallons instead. I only used half the sugar. I put in maple syrup instead of honey. You know, but you did exactly what I said. I get that all the time. And that, you know what? It's part of the job. It's part of how it goes. I'm not angry about it. I think it's kind of funny that people think that's exactly what I did. But, okay, that's the internet for you. But, why measure? Why, why, why should you measure? We've been talking about that already for consistency sake. For also, what does it say about your brew? Now, let me just go on a soapbox right here, right now. I don't care how much alcohol I'm making, okay? I only care relative to the yeast tolerance and safety. That's it. I don't want to make a bottle bomb that's going to hurt us or hurt our cats or hurt our house in any way. And I don't want to make something that's going to spoil in a day because it doesn't have enough to keep. Okay? So that's why we measure. If you... Oh. 
while I'm thinking of it, this question came up too. Somebody said, how do you know what the tolerance of yeast is? That's a really good question. And I still, to this day, do not know why the makers do not just put this on the package. <laughs> it's like the most important thing about that yeast. I really could care less about the esters and fruity cogeners and all the stuff that it does. Tell me what the yeast tolerance is. That's one of the main things that the yeast does. That yeast tolerance and uh, temperature, which they're all rel relatively the same, really. That's all I need to know. Beyond that, it's all minor stuff, really, because, you know, let's just be honest. Yeast versus yeast versus yeast versus yeast, other than tolerance, roughly do the same thing, okay? Especially once you put enough ingredients in, it's all the same. And people are going to hate me for that one, but it's true! So, the way to find out the yeast tolerance is to Google it! Yep. I know, that's crazy, right? But, if you're using one of the yeasts that we commonly use, and you go to our website, city-studying.com, oh, yeah, we actually think. do have a blog post about the yeast that we did in a brew talk before, where I found out all the information made a cute little graph. Yep, and that's for the stuff that we use. But, like, just to make it easy, 71B, right? You literally go to Google, type 71B yeast, or 71B alcohol tolerance. That's it. And it'll, you'll find an article that'll tell you. Usually some merchant that's selling it yeah. has it right in the description. Easy. People have been asking about bread yeast. Now, see, that's not so easy to say, and you can't just look that one up. Because if you do look it up, people are going to tell you 3%. And they'd know, be wrong. They'd be wrong. Well, not really, because there's different kinds of bread yeast. Sure, sure. We use, when we do bread yeast, Fleischmann's Instant Dry Yeast. Yes. If you use that exact yeast, it's been fairly consistent, somewhere between, I'm going to call its tolerance 12%. I, I think that's probably about right. We get anywhere from 11.8 to 12.2. People have gotten higher, people have gotten lower, but in general, it's between 11 and 12, okay? Yeah, I think my graph has a range. If you use like Red Star, um, Red Star bread yeast or baker's yeast, a lot of people have been saying five to 10%. That to me tells a lot of inconsistency. Okay, so maybe that yeast isn't so perfect for that concept for making uh, wine and stuff with. And that's fine, not everything is. Um, people have also asked the other way, if you use wine or beer yeast to make bread, how does it work? It works just fine. It's just about 10 times more expensive, so Unless that's all you got, you know, like right now. But in this day and age, we know yeast of all types is difficult to get. So if you get some yeast, use it. Use it. Yeah. Um, we are going to do a, a lease bread one of these days. But that's another show. It's actually another channel. Um, <laughs> anyway, so it tells about your brew. And this way, you know it did this after this amount of time. Keeping records. You do keep notes, right? You know how I keep notes? I record them. And she writes them down. But we have videos on everything that I did. Therefore, I could just go back and watch the video. And I have a record. I am horrible at keeping notes. Yes. I will tell you the it's truth. True. I really am horrible at it. However, I have, usually have a very good memory. And it constantly confounds people when they'll ask me, well, how much of this did you use in this video from like a year and a half ago? Now, the way YouTube shows a creator of the comments is just a list of comments. And it tells me what video that's on. I can usually answer them without having to check the video. <laughs> so that's why I don't really keep notes. But that's just me. Anyway, um, it is for consistency's sake. It's so that you can reproduce it over and over again. It's, you know, it's, it's kind of common Let's sense. Let's take, for example, if we shall, for a moment, one of our crazier concoctions, Klingon blood wine. Now, when we came up with this recipe, we no just sat about. here and thought, okay, when we evoke the image of Klingon blood wine or Klingons, argh, you know, and what was going to be the flavor profile of that. Klingon. It probably does. And I hopefully didn't, Somebody will tell us. didn't insult anybody, but I was channeling my inner Klingon. Did the ridges come out? They probably did. Um, anyway, so we started throwing all these crazy things into there and luckily we recorded them because it's awesome. The, those flavors com the combined. Wait, 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 wait. wait. You said we just threw all these crazy... No, that was worked out ahead of time. We knew exactly what we were doing. Yes. That was a plan. But did we know it was going to taste that good? Yeah. Brian's eyes right now are brown. They really aren't brown, but they should be brown based on that statement. And I'll let it go at that. Nah, I had a, I had a feeling that it was going to taste pretty good. I didn't know for a fact, but I had a feeling. Anyway, when should you measure? Okay. Don't get too crazy. Don't overmeasure. A lot of people like to take a reading every day. There's no reason to, okay? 
first one day will not change things enough that you need to worry about it and you're risking oxidization every time you take a reading so it's just it's not a good idea and there's no rush to get it off the lease beer is a little bit different beer you know usually within a couple of weeks take a reading and it's probably done you know? basically the 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 best rule of thumb to judge when to measure is when you change something so if you're gonna add something you want to measure sure. to know what you where you're at when you added it when you take something away you want to measure it to know when and it. a rough idea of when you think it might be close to done sure you know like a typical beer like a week um, ciders low low gravity ciders like a week wines I go a month I don't even bother just wait a month then take your first reading mead same thing wait about a month that'll give you a good idea without rushing without risking we used to try to make things good more quickly and I realized how wrong that really was time is your friend and it's it's been such a huge difference to look at it from that perspective and just say eh, it can sit there for three months and I don't care plus the trick is have a bunch of things going at once yes and that way it's a cycle one's coming out of you know one's one's being bottled at the same time that the next one's being racked and the next one's just going into primary fermentation it's a wonderful thing and over time you have plenty to drink and you don't even think about them it only makes your brews that much better the simplest brew that will be the best when the shortest amount of time is a simple wine. Yeah, or cider. Ciders, because the nature of the beast being primarily apple. Beer, actually. Do take some aging to really smooth out. Beer can be, can be quick, but it's a more complicated pro process. Yeah, that's why I preface that with the simplest brew that gets the nicest, the, the quickest, Oh, in my opinion, would be a wine. Yes, then you're right. I was reading notes. I am so sorry. It's okay. She's right. Um, this has kind of gotten a little bit long and rambly and blabbly. That's a word now. So um, I'm just going to read you my final note. And this is very important. We've been doing this for a long time. We still teach people how to do this. And we do stuff on our own. We cook on our own. We bake on our own. We make our own brews. And we still measure everything. So, as always, thanks for watching, guys. Have a great day.